This is Dr. Karen, and you are listening to the DeFacto Leaders Podcast on the Bee Podcast Network, where I help pediatric therapists and educators become better leaders so they can make a bigger impact with their services. With over 15 years of experience supporting school-age kids with diverse learning needs, I'll share up-to-date evidence-based practices, my own experiences, and guest interviews designed to help clinicians, teachers, and aspiring school leaders feel more confident in the way they serve their students and clients. I'll cover a range of topics designed to help you support students' emotional and academic growth and set kids up for success in adulthood, including how to support language, literacy, executive functioning, as well as how to help IEP teams working together to support kids across the day. Whether you want to learn more effective strategies for your therapy sessions or classroom, be a more influential leader on your team, or find creative ways to use your skills to advance in your career, I've got you covered. Hey everybody, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 149 of the DeFacto Leaders Podcast. Today, I am bringing you a solo episode about audiobooks, the Matthew Effect, and the read for 20 minutes a day rule. So I will be mentioning some of my programs throughout. This ties in directly to some of the concepts that I teach in Language Therapy Advanced Foundations, my program that gives SLPs a framework for language therapy. I have had some questions recently about whether or not this program is appropriate for parents or other professionals who are working with language and literacy, and it absolutely is. The program was designed to be delivered in addition to a robust reading curriculum. So it's that supplemental intervention piece that supports the language skills kids need in order to benefit from their reading instructions. When you have those kids who need additional facilitation in the areas of language, specifically things like vocabulary, syntax, and some of those other processing skills that can help them to learn words independently. I specifically designed the program because when I was a school SLP, I felt like I didn't have a good framework for handling that supplemental intervention. So I designed it with SLPs in mind, but typically what I like to have people do when they go through the program, if they are an SLP, is get really clear on what their language therapy protocols are. But many people find that once they have tackled the issue of figuring out what they do in their therapy sessions, they realize that they need to share a lot of these techniques with other people on their team. So they do start consulting and coaching and training some of the other people that they work with to learn about some of these things. So if you're in one of those other positions, like a teacher, you can absolutely learn some of these things and apply them to your classroom. And of course, if you are an SLP and you are frustrated, you feel like you don't have a good system for language therapy and a good way to create a system that aligns with your role in that process of supporting kids' language, academic, and literacy skills, then check out Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. You can go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. So now let's get into this episode. This past year, I had the opportunity to connect with various administrators, as well as ed tech leaders who are selling curriculum products to school districts at a large scale. So these are people who study marketing and trends and have an idea of where the districts are spending money. And during many of these conversations, it became clear that districts are making core evidence-based reading curriculum a priority, which is a good thing. One of the best ways to see what's important to people is to see where money and resources are being invested. And this shows that this is on the agenda for many leaders making decisions about curriculum and staff development. So this makes me optimistic, but it's only part of the equation. What's going on in schools is not the only thing impacting kids. It's also about what's happening outside the school day. So that brings us to the conversation about the school to home connection. 
If the schools are devoting time and money to improving reading instruction, how should the rest of the day look for kids as it pertains to literacy? Should parents be working with kids at home? If so, how much? What about reading? Can we use apps to help build language skills? How about audiobooks? Because it can be challenging for parents to get a struggling reader to sit down with the book, the idea of using a device or an app sounds enticing. I know parents don't want to hear it, but this is not the best option. However, audiobooks are a different story. A question I often get is something like, does listening to audiobooks count as reading? And there are actually several questions being asked here. First, is listening to an audiobook a good idea? Second, can listening to audiobooks build or support skills that improve one's ability to read? And finally, does listening to an audiobook require the same set of skills as reading a print book without the auditory component? I've seen conversations get pretty heated about this topic. I've even seen people be called ableist for suggesting that kids should read actual books. So it's important to understand which question we're actually answering because when they get all muddled together, it gets really confusing. So let's first talk about if listening to an audiobook impacts reading skills. I read a lot about the Matthew effect during my doctoral work as I studied the impact of vocabulary on academic outcomes and literacy. But all the cool kids started talking about it when Malcolm Gladwell published his book, Outliers. The term originally came from the Bible verse, Matthew 25, 29. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Essentially, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. In Outliers, Gladwell talked about hockey players with birthdays at opportune times who are more likely to make the team and have access to higher quality training. My research focused on the impact of vocabulary and language exposure in the home, starting with a seminal study by Hart and Risley in 1995 that showed vast differences in exposure across socioeconomic backgrounds. This trend has continued, which is why I outline this information in the first module of Language Therapy Advanced Foundations, my program that teaches a framework for language therapy. Kids who have been exposed to more sophisticated language are likely to have more robust vocabularies. Having a robust vocabulary makes it much easier to attach meaning to prior knowledge, making it easier to learn new words. Strong background knowledge impacts your response to academic instruction, as well as your ability to comprehend what you read. And reading is one of the most effective ways to improve vocabulary. This is partially because text language is more robust than conversational language, so people who read often are exposed to more sophisticated language on a regular basis compared to those who don't. While background knowledge is not the only thing that impacts your ability to decode, it's certainly a contributing factor. So vocabulary can impact reading and reading can impact vocabulary. It goes both ways. And then there are some other factors, such as our skills and how they impact our habits and tendencies. Kids who have good language skills tend to read more because it's enjoyable for them, so their vocabulary continues to grow. Kids who have weak vocabularies have to work harder, which isn't as pleasant, so they don't do it as often. This means they have less exposure to sophisticated language. So read more, be a better reader, enjoy it more. Avoid reading, miss opportunities, and struggle more. That's what often happens. If kids struggle to read, they may be reading books that contain language that is less sophisticated. So even when they do read, they're still not getting as much exposure to complex linguistic structures as compared to the advanced readers. And this is where audiobooks can be a very useful tool. Listening to an audiobook, or even better, having someone read to them, gives kids a chance to enjoy books they may not be able to read yet. This allows them to get exposure to sophisticated vocabulary that they'd miss out on if they only focused on reading books that they could decode independently. And it's also a way to introduce kids to books in a way that's less intimidating and allows them to feel successful. 
engaging in these types of activities that build vocabulary can improve word knowledge, which is supportive of literacy skills, as I said before. So the verdict is that yes, listening to audiobooks is useful. And yes, they can build foundational skills that can impact one's ability to respond to reading instruction. Now let's move on to the next question. And this is the one that I've seen ruffle some feathers. Is listening to an audiobook using the same skills as reading a book through looking at print? No, it's not. It's supportive, but not sufficient. Activities that build vocabulary, like listening to audiobooks, impact skills that support reading. But if you want to build the skill of being able to read through print, you have to practice that skill directly. Just like someone who wants to learn Braille would have to practice that as well. When you engage with print, you're adding an additional set of skills that aren't present while listening. Decoding requires you to look at a set of print symbols and pair those symbols to a phonological representation of a word. You have to say the sounds in sequence in your head or even sub-vocalize them so you can recognize what the word is. Then you have to understand the meaning of that word both individually and in the context of the sentence, paragraph, or entire message. Writing adds another step because you have to create the written symbols while simultaneously reading them back to yourself. If a child is struggling to read, audiobooks are a great way to supplement reading for purposes of language development and sheer enjoyment. But if you want to get better at decoding print, you need to practice looking at the print symbols and having opportunities to actively engage with them. I share some strategies for facilitating this process in Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. Now, of course, people should have access to accommodations and accessibility features wherever it's appropriate. And audio content is a completely legitimate way to consume information, especially when you have a long commute or as an alternative to mindless scrolling. And sure, it counts if you've listened to a book. But for kids, especially ones that are struggling to read, giving them opportunities to engage with print is essential. And yes, the explicit instruction should be happening during the school day. But many parents want to know what they can do above and beyond to support what's going on at school. So that brings us to the next part of the conversation. Obviously, schools need to do their job providing a robust reading curriculum. But what happens outside the school day is really important as well. So people want to know things like how much reading is enough? What should be happening outside of school to support reading instruction? And where did the rule of read for 20 minutes a day come from? Well, I can't discuss this topic without at least mentioning the homework discussion. One of the largest studies on homework done by Harris Cooper and colleagues showed that homework is correlated with positive outcomes in certain situations, depending on factors like grade and dosage. So their conclusion to is homework beneficial was... It depends. But then a handful of journalists, researchers, and consultants poked holes in Cooper's study for including a lot of correlational data, which is a fair point. But here's my beef with the critics of Cooper's work. Cooper and colleagues did a robust synthesis taken from a 16-year time period, were transparent about the design flaws, and explained nuance, concluding that there's likely a point of diminishing returns with homework and it's only beneficial in certain cases. But the most common counterclaim often made is that there are no data to support the long-term benefits of homework, which isn't entirely accurate. I wouldn't call 16 years of studies no data. Studies with design flaws are better than assumptions that lack data to support them, which is what some critics have responded with, which has resulted in a lot of pushback from people who are pro-homework. If you believe that something is beneficial, maybe you've seen the benefits in individual cases, and then someone challenges those assumptions and doesn't really have a lot of solid evidence to support what they're saying, then Typically, you're not going to be very open to their suggestions, and this is what I see happening. A lot of times the criticism of Cooper's work is correlation does not equal causation, which is true. But then some of the things that they come back with and some of the connections that they draw about 
what causes what lack any evidence. So a lot of people who bought into the recommendations based on Cooper's study have kind of tuned them out. But not everybody who challenges the idea of homework is coming back with straw man arguments. And John Hattie's meta-analysis is something that's commonly cited as proof that homework isn't beneficial. He aggregated so many variables together that it became an apples to oranges comparison across all the different studies. Because when you look beyond the overall effect size, some of the studies showed results similar to what Cooper found, which is that some studies showed a potential benefit of homework in some cases. And the main issue that people have with lumping all of those variables and studies together into one effect size is that it makes it difficult to answer practical questions about specifics. Things like, how are we determining if homework is working? Are we looking at literacy outcomes or other academic skills? Are we looking at future employment, grades, mental health diagnoses, whether kids completed college or trade school, their income when they're adults, rates of incarceration? What are we actually looking at here and how do we define success? That often isn't clear when people say that homework doesn't work. And then another question is, what do we count as homework? How can we say that something isn't effective if we don't even know what we're talking about? Are we talking about reading, doing math problems, phonics activities, ongoing projects, writing assignments? We don't really have much to work with from a practical standpoint when we haven't defined the two most important variables. So maybe we should be asking a different question. And this brings us back to the reading discussion. We might not have good research on the ideal homework formula, but we do have research on what impacts reading. We know that reading is beneficial. So if homework includes reading, that's compelling enough evidence for me. But what does that look like and what's the ideal amount? So a common recommendation is that we should read 20 minutes a day, several times a week with our kids. I had a hard time nailing down a specific study that proved that this is the ideal amount, but here's the rationale behind it. First, I found a couple sources that cited the number of words you'd be exposed to each year based on the 20 minute formula, and it was over a million. And we know that being exposed to a lot of robust vocabulary is beneficial. I couldn't find a study that pinpointed the exact length of time we should be reading, although there is a large body of work that shows the impact of reading on language. So we know that doing reading is going to impact our language skills. But why 20 minutes? Well, giving a specific time makes things clear and actionable. Telling people, read a book with your child for 20 minutes is a lot more specific than saying, read with your child for an unspecified amount of time. If instructions are vague, follow through is poor, and then we run the risk of people doing nothing. Finally, 20 minutes is a manageable amount of time. Is it better to read for an hour? Possibly. But is it realistic for many families? Not likely. So consistency trumps perfection here, and I believe that the 20 minute rule came from a practical standpoint and considering what people can actually fit into their busy days. Now, a counter argument that I've seen to the idea of reading or doing any type of schoolwork outside of the school day is the claim that asking a struggling reader to sit down with the book is torture and will make them hate reading. If anyone has some literature that can refute the large body of research that shows the exact opposite, I'd be very interested in reading it. But for now, I'm continuing to recommend a minimum of 20 minutes a day of actual reading. From a practical standpoint, how this can look is that you can take turns reading out loud for younger kids and transition more to silent reading as kids get more advanced and find a balance between letting them choose books they're familiar with and venturing outside their comfort zone. This can include things like graphic novels, but remember that we want to make sure that kids are spending time reading typical books. So this formula plus a robust curriculum at school with some audiobooks thrown in is a solid plan. And with the other homework, that can also count as reading time too, depending on what it is. Again, this is why we need to define what homework looks like before we can determine if it's beneficial. 
So I usually recommend making required homework a priority before adding additional reading, especially if families are having a hard time fitting it all in. And of course, parents shouldn't be micromanaging the planning process or doing the homework for kids. A positive thing that I'm seeing is that many districts in my state, which is Illinois, are prioritizing skill building activities like reading and math and are transitioning to project-based learning in the older grades with time and study hall to get work done. So this allows for a good portion of work to be done in school, making it more feasible for kids to read for pleasure at home. So it's really focused on what skills we need to build and what activities we need to do in order to help kids apply those skills. Homework isn't off limits per se, but work is only done at home when it can't be finished at school. This often makes more sense than assigning homework for the sake of doing homework. It's becoming more about figuring out what skills and opportunities districts and families need to provide kids in both reading and other areas, and how to fit them into the time slots between home and school. This, in my opinion, is a more useful question to ponder than asking, is homework beneficial? And I know that a lot of schools aren't at this point yet, but I'm hopeful things can change, especially based on some of the conversations that I have had this past year. I wanted to mention a couple of them right now because I have some great episodes that you can listen to that can share some of the ideas that are floating around in the education reform space. I know it takes time for those things to trickle down to the schools, but if the ideas are being discussed, then that means that some of the implementation is happening. We can't get to the implementation if we don't have the idea. So the fact that those things are on the radar of people who are making some of those changes is a good thing. For a great conversation on this topic, check out De Facto Leaders, episode 114, Do School Leaders Need Coaching with Dan Kelly? We talked a lot about the support that school leaders need in that conversation, but we also talked about what that can lead to. And Dan mentioned some really exciting things that he's seen happening as it pertains to project-based learning at the high school level. I also encourage you to check out episode 139, Cell Phones, one-to-one device initiatives, and homework policies in K-12 education with Dr. John Berkey. Dr. Berkey spent 12 years as a superintendent, has had a long career in education, and is currently the executive director of LUTA, the large unit district association in Illinois that supports a number of districts in the Chicago area. So he's really seeing a lot of initiatives that are being pushed through in the schools. I have seen very different perspectives when I talk to people who are working directly with students versus people who are addressing some of these issues at the macro level. I encourage you to listen to that conversation. And we did discuss the topic of homework policies and the idea of homework. A lot of the answers to the questions I asked him were, I don't know what's best. And a lot of the leaders are well aware of the issues, but there aren't clear answers. Because I spend a fair amount of time in groups of professionals that are working directly with students, there is this idea that there's a disconnect between the leadership. I've even seen people straight out suggest that the leadership have no idea what's going on directly with kids. I push back on that. I think that they do understand, but I think that because they're seeing this from a different perspective and seeing all of the other things that are going on from a bird's eye view, I don't think they're as far removed as people realize. I think that they just have different information that is sometimes difficult to see when you are seeing just one piece of the puzzle. So that's why I always encourage people to look at these issues from multiple perspectives both micro and macro. Finally, for another great discussion, check out episode 144, Becoming a School Founder and Empowering Students Through Project-Based Learning with Tanya Sheckley. Tanya is a school founder and she does a lot of work with project-based learning. We also discussed the concept of 
how we can think about the homeschool connection as it pertains to recommending reading for pleasure, as well as how project-based learning can tie in. And there's this idea that when you have an ongoing project, you have the ability to think long-term and to decide what makes sense when it comes to managing all those time blocks between home and school, such as study hall and thinking, you know, does it make sense for me to work on this project or do some research outside of school? That way, those activities are a lot more purposeful and intentional rather than just saying, we should be assigning 30 minutes of homework per night, for example. So we get into a great conversation about how we can start asking the right questions about that connection, about how parents can support what's going on in schools in that conversation. So again, those episodes were episode 114 with Dan Kelly, episode 139 with Dr. John Berkey, and episode 144 with Tanya Sheckley. And feel free to scroll the rest of the episodes because I have a ton about evidence-based instruction and intervention as it pertains to language and literacy. I'll close with a quick story about my childhood. I was a struggling reader. I did not like it when I was younger and reading was one of my least favorite times of the day. And you know what helped me love it? Getting good at it. I had mean parents who told me to read in my free time instead of letting me get a Nintendo. And while that may have prevented me from getting to the final level of the original Super Mario Brothers, I'm guessing my reading skills have served me way more than my gaming skills would have. So thanks, Mom and Dad. In closing, schools have a huge responsibility. It's why I provide programs that provide detailed training that walk school clinicians through effective interventions for supporting language and literacy. But of course, schools can't do this as effectively without help from adults who support kids outside of school. Before I wrap up, I wanted to remind you to check the show notes for a handful of resources that I mentioned in this episode, including the link to an article on my blog where I go through this content in written format if you'd rather read it or if you just want to have a written supplement to this episode. Also, check the show notes for the links to the other podcast episodes that I mentioned for conversations about homework, device policies, project-based learning, as well as the home school connection. And finally, if you are a therapist or professional who wants to learn how to support language and literacy, if you want to learn a way to help those students who need language intervention above and beyond a robust reading curriculum, check out Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. In this program, I walk through a five-component framework that builds those foundational skills that are going to support reading, language, and writing. These are going to be critical for students' academic success, as well as vocational success outside of school. To check out that program, go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language therapy. If you have a suggestion for a guest, or if you would like to be a guest on the show, please send me an email at talktome at drkarenspeech.com. I'm always interested in connecting with people who are using their teaching, clinical, or leadership skills in creative ways to support kids. If you've been enjoying de facto leaders, please leave me a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. <music>